I'm Jim Baxter, and this is Lecture 6, Habitat and Niche for General Ecology. In our discussion of evolutionary ecology, we've talked about how through natural selection, each species has evolved a particular set of adaptations that increases its overall fitness under the prevailing environmental conditions in which it lives. In our, our lecture on uh, life histories, we explored how through its unique set of adaptations, each species is a unique solution to the challenge of survival and reproduction in different environments. This uh, constitutes the species' life history. But each species can also be characterized by the set of physical and biotic conditions under which it can persist, that is, that it can survive and reproduce, and the range of resources it uses. In this lecture, we will examine a key concept that ecologists use to describe species, not through their adaptations per se, but through the conditions and resources that they require, and in turn, uh, that they alter. To introduce this way of thinking, let's first def define a couple of terms. A habitat is a place in the environment that is inhabited by a particular species of organism. It's, it's the place where the organism lives and encompasses all of the physical, um, chemical, etc., environmental factors that surrounds the species. A habitat is made up of a set of physical factors like soil, moisture, temperature, and light, as well as a host of biotic factors, um, other organisms, that is. Uh, such as the availability of food, the presence of predators, competitors, etc. But a habitat is not only a geographic area on the ground. For example, for a parasite, it's the body of its host, or maybe a part of the host's body, like the digestive tract, or even a cell within the host's body. Ecologists often describe and classify habitats into general groupings, that are classified on the basis of more or less obvious visual or even functional characteristics, whether a location on the ground or, or in a host's body. I've included a couple of examples here, going from the top left to right or a, a redwood forest, a coral reef, a desert, and in the case of this parasite, the inside of a human host. All of these are different kinds of habitats. It's a, it's a place um, where an organism lives. Within habitats, environmental conditions vary continuously from one place to another, as well, of course, as over time. Therefore, every species experiences a range of abiotic and biotic conditions within their habitat. Given the suite of adaptations um, a, a species has, it will have a limited range of tolerances to the conditions present within its habitat. These are called ecological tolerances. Where conditions are optimal for growth and reproduction, the species will thrive and its population will be abundant. As environmental conditions deviate away from this optimum and towards the edge of its tolerances, it becomes more difficult for individuals of the species <coughs> to survive and reproduce and so population sizes will decline. Therefore, where you find a species within its habitat is strongly determined by its own evolved ecological tolerances to the range of conditions in those habitats. Sugar maple is a good example of the importance of a species' ecological tolerances in determining where it occurs. This map shows the area where sugar maple occurs naturally. The area in red what's called, uh, shows what's called its geographic range. The geographic range is defined uh, as the area where all individuals of the species occurs. Although the entire geographic range of sugar maple is filled in red, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it, uh, the individuals of the species occur continuously over this entire area. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of uh, different kinds of hab you know, uh, habitats within this geographic range. It just means that sugar maple is not found naturally outside of this, um, this boundary. You can see from the map that all individuals of sugar maple occur within a defined geographic area. 
restricted on its sides by conditions that are outside of the ecological tolerance range for this species. Well, for sugar maple, what are those conditions? In the north, sugar maple, uh, which is a broadleaf deciduous species, that means it, it loses its leaves in the winter, um, cannot tolerate the cold winters because its leaves um, are susceptible to freezing. Um, in the north, it's replaced by other species, conifer species that have um, lower surface area, needle-like needle, needle -like leaves that are much more tolerant to those extreme cold temperatures that uh, occur in the wintertime. In the south, sugar maple's broad leaves um, also lose too much moisture because of the high surface area conditions, uh, high surface area of the leaves um, in these very hot conditions. So it tends to be outcompeted by other species who are able to retain water better um, th through different types of, of adaptations. In the West, conditions are um, get drier. And again, the broad leaves, which lose a lot of moisture, um, uh, mean that it becomes outcompeted by more drought tolerant species. So, and of course, on the east, um, I don't think I have to explain why it doesn't occur east of the geographic range. Um, in the Atlantic Ocean, obviously, it's a completely different habitat. Um, so, sugar maple is bounded um, by certain ranges of conditions that are outside of its tolerance range. Now, species to species, um, they differ from one another, of course, in, in their tolerances. So every species has a range of tolerances to a variety of conditions. Um, and this differs across species. In the European Alps, species ranging from trees to herbs differ significantly um, in a particular aspect of their physiology, that is, their photosynthetic rates. And these differ by altitude. This table lists a variety of plant species from the European Alps that differ in their range of net photosynthesis by altitude. By net photosynthesis, I mean that they take up, they can take up more carbon through photosynthesis than they'll lose through respiration. This is um, called, uh, sometimes called a positive carbon balance because they're, they're taking up more carbon than they're losing. So uh, this table here lists a variety of different species ranging from herbs to shrubs and trees um, and showing the characteristic uh, different altitudes at which they occur. This shaded area to the right here shows the temperature range over which the corresponding species in that table shows net photosynthesis, or in other words, positive carbon balance. You can see that as you go up in altitude, the temperature range um, obviously declines, and um, the temperature range over which the different species exhibit net photosynthesis actually declines. This corresponds, of course, to the fact that as you go up in altitude, temperatures decline. And um, coincident with that, each species is adapted in its photosynthetic rate to the local temperature conditions. Over a range of environmental conditions, the performance of a species is strongly influenced by these tolerances to the conditions in which it exists. The ability of a species to thrive, that is, to grow and to reproduce, is highest near a certain optimal range of environmental conditions. This graph shows a conceptual model of the expected performance of a species, that is, its ability to grow and reproduce across a range of environmental conditions or factors. The um, x-axis is, is the range of factors or conditions, and the y-axis is the performance. The model predicts that species performance will be highest near a theoretical optimum, which is the central portion of the bell curve. 
and decline as conditions deviate from that optimum. This type of curve that relates environmental conditions to species performance is called an ecological response curve. In the model, extreme conditions at the end of the response curve are outside the ecological tolerance range of the species and are therefore lethal to it. But as conditions become less extreme, that is moving towards the central part of the graph, individuals of the species are able to not only survive, but in more optimal conditions uh, also grow and reproduce. Let, let's take a look at this, at this pattern. This first band shows the range of environmental conditions over which the species is actually able to survive. Okay, um, But some of those conditions towards the ends of the, you know, toward the more extreme ends of, of this response curve, um, you know, the, that species um, cannot actually add biomass and grow or reproduce. Um, those, those capabilities will only happen as it gets closer to this optimal range. So this narrower band, narrower band um, that's closer to the optimum shows the range of conditions over which the species is not only able to survive, but also to grow. That is to, you know, put on biomass, etc. This even narrower band here, which is nearest the optimal environmental conditions for the species, um, allows for not only survival and growth, but also reproduction which, of course, is critical for persistence of the species in its habitat. So you can see that um, depending upon the factor or condition, uh, the ability of the species to survive, grow, and also reproduce is influenced by the degree uh, to which um, the factor or condition deviates from its optimum. But ec ecological tolerances only tell part of the story. That is, how species respond to habitat conditions. What it doesn't do is incorporate how an organism uses its environment to make a living. This idea is captured in the concept of the niche. In addition to the conditions that affect where an organism occurs, each species also uses resources in its environment. By using those resources, it also alters the availability of the resources for other species. This leads us to the concept of the niche, in which ecologists describe species not based solely on their adaptations or where they occur, but based on the conditions they require and the resources they use. For example, the eagle pictured here not only re, um, responds to a variety of abiotic and biotic factors in its environment, but it also uses resources and therefore, um, or thereby alters their availability. To survive and reproduce, the eagle both responds to and uses resources like food, nest building materials, nesting sites, etc. By using these resources, it alters their availability for other individuals of the same and different species. This bristlecone pine tree on the right responds to a variety of factors as well, including temperature, soil moisture, and nutrient availability. But it also uses resources like water and nutrients from the soil that it takes up through its root system, which are then unavailable, those resources that is, for other species. Of course, it also utilizes CO2 from the atmosphere, releases oxygen into the atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis. So again, it's it's altering nutrients, um, you know, based on its activities. Fungi, like this death cap as well, respond to moisture, pH, and soil organic matter, while also altering soil conditions for other organisms by taking up water and nutrients from the soil and consuming dead organic matter. If it happens to be a, a, a mycorrhizal fungus, that is a, a symbiotic mutualist that colonizes plants to the benefit of both, um, it's modulating plant host nutrient availability through that 
symbiotic mutualism, and, and so on. So I think you get the point. <laughs> so the ecological niche tells us something essential about how an organism's organism fits into an eco ecological system that it occupies through the conditions it requires, but also the nutrients and resources that it uses. So uh, this is, a, as I, I like to say, a worthy definition of, of the ecological niche. Um, given this definition, the niche encompasses both the environmental conditions and resource usage as a means of understanding how organisms make a living um, and also impact other species. Through the process of natural selection, each species has evolved a combination of adaptations that allow it to occupy a specific niche. The niche is actually a fairly old concept. Um, it was developed in the early part of the 20th century and was first coin coined by Joseph Grinnell, uh, who was a naturalist and then later a UC Berkeley professor. Grinnell's concept of the niche was that it was the sum of the habitat requirements and behaviors that allowed a species to persist and produce offspring in its environment. His was a place-based concept and, and did not utilize any or include any use of resources by a species. Later, Charles Elton, who was a British animal ecologist, broadened the definition and, and it was to include a kind of a functional element, if you will. Uh, his you know, expertise was in animals, and so he focused on describing the niche as, quote, an organism's place in the biotic environment, and especially its relations to food and enemies. So here's where the sort of this interaction or, or use of, of, you know, resources started to come in. Um, but Grinnell's and, and Elton's concepts were kind of divergent and hadn't really been unified into a common approach. That's where G. Evelyn Hutchinson comes in. Um, Hutchinson, further, Hutchinson further expanded the, the niche concept by combining, um, combining environmental conditions and resources into a unified and more quantitative approach. He defined the niche as a multidimensional space um, that took into account all of the different environmental conditions and resources uh, that define the requirements of an individual or a species to practice its way of life. Um, and most importantly, um, you know, for its population to be able to persist. So let, let's take a look at the Hutchinsonian niche concept uh, from a graphical perspective. This is how it's um, often depicted, um, but we'll also look at a real example of, of the Hutchinsonian niche with its different dimensions. Hutchinson's concept of the niche was that it was what's called an n-dimensional hypervolume. <laughs> um, simply all that means is that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a space that has multiple dimensions, those dimensions um, defining uh, the variables relating to the set of conditions that the species needs and the resources that it requires for it to persist, that is, for it to survive and reproduce. So um, this was depicted as a, as a graph with different axes for all of those different variables. For each axis, there's a range of values or conditions that permit the species to survive and reproduce. This, this region represents Hutchinson's n-dimensional volume, or hypervolume, as he called it where n is simply the number of variables being considered. For simplicity, let's take a two-dimensional example, that is sort of two axes, um, two variables that influence um, the species. One will be a condition, the other one a, a resource. Um, though we could theoretically include any number of additional conditions or resources required by the species to make the graph multidimensional, it would get kind of difficult to imagine. After three dimensions, it becomes impossible to really visualize graphically. 
though there are software packages that can quantitatively define niches in more than three dimensions. In this illustration, we'll look at a simple two-dimensional niche that involves one condition, that is temperature, and one resource, and that is prey size. In the same way we conceptualized ecological response curves graphically, we can also plot as a band the range of temperature over which our species is found. Although in this graph I plotted it as a single solid band, in actuality our imaginary species would likely show a bell-shaped response curve to temperature, right, with some optimum performance at a middle range of temperatures. Later um, in the course, when we discuss niche overlap and competition, um, we'll construct the niche as a bell-shaped response curve. But for now, and, and for the sake of illustration, let's, let's just keep it simple and I'll, I'll keep it as a band, um, you know, showing the, the overall range um, where the, the species is found, temperature range, that is. Okay, so by the same token, we can also plot as an even band the range of prey sizes that our species consumes as a resource. You'll notice now that these bands overlap. So prey size, which is a resource, um, varies in terms of the size that the, the species um, requires, and also it varies in where we find it with regard to this variable of temperature. So these bands overlap, and where they overlap is called the niche space, okay, at least in this graphical space that we've created here, or this conceptual space, where we would expect this species to exist. That is, exist as defined by these two axes of temperature and prey size. Where they overlap, Hutchinson called the region defined by these, by the conditions and resources, um, under which a species could survive and reproduce, he called that the fundamental niche. In our two-dimensional example here, our fundamental niche is defined simply by temperature and prey size. Were we to add additional axes, our fundamental niche would be defined by the area encompassed by the intersection of, the, of um, you know, those multiple axes. If we added a third axis, a fourth, a fifth, etc., um, that that fundamental niche would be defined by all of those variables collectively. And of course, with many axes beyond three axes, it becomes very difficult to, to visualize. But, um, you know, and so on. So if we imagine that there's a bell-shaped response curve of species performance along each of these axes, the fundamental niche would actually appear more as a set of isolines indicating um, the two-dimensional optima for both temperature and prey size. Um, so it wouldn't exactly be sort of a box as shown here, but it would be more of, of some kind of irregular shape, uh, depending upon the range, you know, the, the optimal range of temperature and prey size is where we would tend to find species. So it might look a little bit like a topographical map. Um, so, well, anyway, enough, enough theory. Let's look at a real example where we'll get a chance to kind of look at, at a, a, a niche um, for a particular bird species that, that does kind of show these um, optima. So this is a graphical representation of the feeding niche for the blue-gray gnatcatcher. This is a, a tree-dwelling insectivorous bird um, and, and so uh, what's, you know, important about its foraging niche are a couple of, of variables. One is foraging height, that is the height in the tree where it forages, and then also the size of the prey indicated here as prey length. Um, note that the two axes shown relate specifically, therefore, to feeding, either where in the tree it forages and the range of prey size excuse me, it consumes. The isolines on the graph, which look something like a topographical map, represent the capture rates, that is, as percentages of the insect prey of different sizes at different heights, okay, as a percentage of its diet, that is. 
Um, the darker areas represent higher insect capture rates. Okay, so from this graphical depiction of, of the gnat catcher's niche, niche space, you can pretty clearly see that the gnat catcher, gnat catcher is most successful in foraging and therefore likely to achieve greater fitness um, between approximately three to and five meters in height and also um, that it prefers prey between three, about three and to four and a half millimeters in size. And, and that's kind of depicted by this darker um, area in the center here where the arrow is pointing, okay? So that shows you the prey length range and the foraging height range at which um, it has the highest percentage of its diet as, as um, you know, in those ranges of prey length and, and foraging height, okay? Um, it, it's also worth noting that as a result of its occupying this particular foraging niche, the gnat catcher is reducing the availability of this food resource for other insectivorous species. Okay, um, so the way the niche is, is illustrated here, it's, um, it's as this sort of topographical map where we can see that there's a range of... Um, uh, of, of, uh, of foraging um, in terms of height and a range of prey sizes that it goes after and that it prefers um, a fairly narrow prey length although it, it will vary uh, depending on prey availability and also there's a fairly narrow range of foraging heights that it, it prefers but it will also forage outside of those ranges um, it's just that the percentage of its diet that it gets from those different heights and prey lengths outside of the maximum um, will decline and of course therefore it would affect its fitness as it moves away from those optimal um, conditions. So if, if a species occupies a niche that another species also uses, okay, and of course in natural communities, there are many different species interacting with one another and competing for some of the same kinds of nutrients and resources. Um, if other species, you know, are, are accessing the same niche space, then the two species will overlap um, in their niche space and therefore be in direct competition with one another for those resources. In this scenario, the better competitor will encroach on the niche of the less competitive species, thereby reducing the niche space um, that it's actually able to use. This is what's called the realized niche of a species. It's the niche that results from the interaction of, uh, of, the, of a species with other species that overlap in its niche space. Let's take a look. So if we imagine a, a, a particular species, labeled species one here, um, and we show its fundamental niche. So this would be the niche of a particular species um, uh, that, that forages on um, a range of prey sizes and foraging heights, okay? And these ranges of prey size and foraging height are the, you know, what it's capable of. Okay, um, you can kind of imagine it like the gnat catcher example that we just um, looked at. But obviously there are other species that live in its habitat that also, you know, are foraging at similar heights and prey sizes. Maybe not identically overlapping with this species one, but um, in all likelihood overlapping in some part of species one's niche. If two other species live in the same area as species one and, and overlap to some degree with it in where they forage and in the prey sizes that they eat, and um, these other species can outcompete species one for insect consumption where their niches do overlap, then the fundamental niche of species one will be affected. Okay, so where those interactions occur, the competition occurs, this will reduce the area of overlap 
um, with those species and reduce the the prey sizes and foraging heights that species one has access to. So again, we know that multiple species coexist and there's overlap in their resource use. And this sets up the situation where high niche overlap and consequent direct competition should lead to evolution in resource use and evolution in reduced niche overlap. So if this occurs, and species two and three are more competitive than species one in these ranges of prey sizes and foraging heights, then species one's niche will be reduced by some amount. And, and Hutchinson called this the realized niche. So Hutchinson's niche concept defines the niche conditions necessary for different species to evolve in their resource use. In the, f um, you know, and in particular, in the face of competitive interactions with other species. So what kinds of other interactions might affect the evolution of a species niche? Well, clearly there are many other kinds of interactions that, that could potentially impinge upon a species niche. Um, predation might be one um, where uh, that would certainly reduce the size of the niche for a particular species due to another biological interaction. And we'll be talking more about um, competition uh, and predation in, in subsequent lectures. And we'll revisit this concept of, of the realized niche um, when we do talk about those concepts. So let's take a look at a real life example um, of the fundamental uh, versus realized niche, and we'll do it in two species of barnacle that occupy areas of the California coast. Um, the one species is is Thalamus, um, and it's spelled C H T H, which is a, an awfully strange spelling, but it's pronounced Thalamus uh, and Balanus. These are two different species of barnacle. They occupy different tidal zones in the intertidal region uh, along the coast. Without Balanus present, if we focus on Thalamus, if, if Balanus is not present, Thalamus can actually occupy the entire range of tidal zones from low to high tide. And this is signified on the left here um, in the brown arrow uh, for the fundamental niche of Thalamus. Okay, the brown color corresponds to the brown uh, uh, colored species um, of Thalamus there. So if Balanus were not present, Thalamus could actually occur all the way from that low, to low tide line all the way up to the high tide line. Okay. On the other hand, Balanus can occupy the area from the low uh, to some sort of middle tide level, but can't survive in the high tide areas simply because of its own ecological tolerance limits. Uh, it's not very well adapted to um, dry conditions. Thalamus, however, can tolerate um, relatively dry conditions, which is why it can occur higher up on those um, on the intertidal zone. And so the the fundamental niche of Balanus is indicated on the left there in that blue arrow corresponding to the the, the blue illustrated um, barnacles of Thalamus. So, as indicated in the illustration, the fundamental niche of Thalamus spans the entire tidal zone, whereas the fundamental niche of Balanus extends from the low to the middle tidal zone. Now, the interesting thing here is that Balanus actually outcompetes Thalamus in the lower tidal zone by literally wedging it off of the rock. Pretty mean, huh? <laughs> what this means is that the realized niche of Thalamus is drastically reduced by competition with Balanus, and you can see that on the right um, with the arrows showing the realized niches of both species. The realized niche of Thalamus is restricted up into those higher tidal zones um, because of competition by Balanus from below. Um, you'll notice that the, the realized niche of Balanus is ac has actually not changed um, with respect to Thalamus. Um, so this is where the concept of 
and competition, these interactions with other species can dramatically influence the actual niche you know, occupied by a particular species through species interactions. This concludes uh, Lecture 6 on Habitat and the Niche.